Hello my fellow Plutonians and welcome back to my channel. I actually did not plan on making this video at all. I stayed up late last night to watch Johnny's UK appeal hearing live and I woke up this morning to a few of my patrons asking me to talk about it, comment about it, what I thought, etc. I actually linked it live to them, so hence that discussion. But that's what spurred this video. So we've already been through the Grounds of Appeal in quite some detail in an earlier video that I released this year. It will be linked down below for your convenience if you haven't seen it already. The reason I'm stating this is because the appeal hearing was basically the oral version of these arguments, but still in an even more condensed form because of time constraints. I'm actually really glad that I took a few notes as the appeal hearing was going on, again, not knowing I was gonna make a video because now I have some notes to rely on for this video. Basically, the hearing started off with the fresh evidence application being the charity donations that apparently never took place. And what the Court of Appeal, the two judges, were really interested in was why Johnny's team wasn't able to get that evidence through subpoenas or other measures before the UK trial. The main reason that was relied upon by Mr. Caldecott, who was representing Johnny during the hearing, Mr. Sherborn was actually sitting right behind him, is COVID and of course the multiple delays and all the effects, the ripple effect of the pandemic. There was a lot of back and forth, a lot of questioning. Again, I did not plan on making this video, so I'm not gonna remember everything and it was late at night, but essentially they stated that because of COVID, we couldn't get these documents on time. And further to that, Amber didn't even really mention the charity donations until February of 2020, a few months before the trial. So it was only from February 2020 that Johnny's team was obligated to get these documents to contradict her assertion that she donated every single cent. So they weren't that late and they did issue subpoenas or try to get this evidence around May of 2020, but it just wasn't received on time for the trial. And again, they're citing staff shortages and just COVID, which is, you know, quite believable. Everyone was in lockdown at that time. And even if people were going into work or working remotely from home, there was a significant shortage of staff at the time, not just in the children's hospital or the ACLU, but all over the world, we've all experienced how drastically COVID affected the staffing levels, access to resources, etc. Now, another issue, or a question rather, I shouldn't say issue because it does kind of have a negative connotation to it. Another question that the Court of Appeal wanted to know was why wasn't Amber cross-examined on the donations, which she wasn't? The only mention really of the charity donations was when Mr. Justice Nichols said that that doesn't indicate that she is a gold digger. And the answer for Mr. Caldecott was basically that because they didn't have the evidence to contradict her, they didn't want to just cross-examine her on something that they could not rebut with such clarity and certainty. So they didn't just want it to be, you lied, didn't you? You never donated it. Oops, sorry, your honor, we, we don't have the evidence to prove our assertions. We just think she lied. You know what I mean? That's kind of what the back and forth was between Mr. Caldecott and the Court of Appeal because they kept kind of pressing him on that issue. You could have still cross-examined her even if you didn't have the evidence why not just put it out there, put it on the record that she lied? And Mr. Caldecott kept trying to steer them back to the main crux of it, which is we didn't have the evidence to back our claims up. Now, whether the Court of Appeal was satisfied with that response, I can't tell. I mean, the two judges, the main one who was actually doing all the questioning, they're both very stoic and I couldn't read them. They're very professional, that's how judges are. In fact, if a judge starts wearing their heart on their sleeve and starts getting, you know, kind of emotional or agitated or combative, then that's not really the best kind of judge that you want sitting in on your case. Judges are trained to have this very removed, stoic kind of demeanor. Within reason, they're human, everyone's different. But these particular judges, especially the main one who was doing all the questioning, was very hard to read. As in, I didn't know whether he bought it or whether he didn't. 
And then Mr. Caldecott made a further point to say that she said so in her witness statement that she donated all the money. And from that point on, it was never corrected. It was never amended to reflect the fact that she didn't actually donate the money. So Mr. Caldecott is saying they wanted to hide that fact because if they were going to be open about it, or rather if Amber was going to be open about it in cross-examination or at any point, then she would have made it known and corrected this mistaken belief that the donations actually took place. Because she never said, I made partial donations, I'm on my way to completing the pledge. She always made it out that the donations were done in full. And then the last note that was made pertaining to the charity evidence was made in rebuttal or in response to NGN's position. Because Mr. Walansky, one of the lawyers who were involved in the trial, got up after Johnny's team had their go to tell the court why permission shouldn't be granted to adduce this fresh evidence. And also I'm looking at the transcripts right now of this hearing. I will link them down below in the description box. So the judge, one of them, the very vocal and interactive one is called Lord Justice Underhill. After Mr. Wolanski's rebuttal, Mr. Caldecott had a right of response and he made one more point, which is if she wasn't lying about this and if she isn't still lying about it, why is she trying so hard to suppress the evidence. And at that point, I went, yes, yes. Like I was watching some kind of tennis match or something because that is an excellent point. And the court didn't have anything to say in response to that. The only response Lord Justice Underhill made was he kind of nodded and he made notes which he did throughout, by the way. He just took notes the entire time, along with his colleague. Lord Justice Underhill also asked Mr. Caldecott, what's really the relevance of this charity evidence? Doesn't it just go directly to her credibility? And Mr. Caldecott responded with, no, it doesn't just go to her credibility. It doesn't just paint her out to be a liar. It also makes it less likely that her allegations are true. Because sometimes I don't want to get into an evidence law lesson. And also I am not hundred percent sure if this is what the judge is hinting at, but sometimes evidence that just goes solely to a witness's credibility is inadmissible. It's called the credibility rule here in Australia. So from what I understood from Mr. Caldecott, I'm not necessarily saying that this is exactly what he meant, but it's my understanding that by failing to donate the money to DV shelters, that makes it all the more less likely that she herself was a victim of DV. Does that make sense? I hope it makes sense. So Mr. Wolanski's rebuttal to the fresh evidence arguments was basically that Johnny's team had ample time and many different ways through which they could have obtained the charity evidence before the UK trial. So he said she could have been cross-examined. They should have subpoenaed way earlier in the US. They should have done more things abroad. And essentially he just focused on how they didn't do their due diligence to get the evidence on time. Now they are fair arguments to make, but again, when you really think about COVID and how it's impacted every area of our lives, it's basically shut down the world last year. It also becomes very easy to believe that Johnny's team just couldn't get their hands on the documents on time. And then they moved on to the actual main application to appeal. So there are two separate applications. First was the fresh evidence application, which in courts of appeal can only be admissible under exceptional circumstances. And then they moved on to the main crux of the issue, the entire trial. So under the limited time period, Mr. Caldecott focused on this main point, which is the judge failed in his fact finding. And that's of course an umbrella term that covers all of the points that I made in my video, analyzing the judgment and then in the appeal video. So it was described by Mr. Caldecott as a material misdirection in the fact finding phase. He mentioned that the judge just inherently favored any evidence that was positive towards Amber and completely disregarded any evidence that favored Johnny. 
and then vice versa, ignored any evidence that was adverse to Amber and accepted evidence that was adverse to Johnny. Of course, he talked about the phone recording in which she admitted to being the instigator, the perpetrator, and Johnny would just run away and he was a big baby. And he said how the judge ignored that because he favored Amber's sworn testimony, which is erroneous because that recording is contemporary evidence. It was said in the moment with no premeditation, no preparation for, you know, giving testimony in a court of law where you're really going to edit yourself and you're going to probably rehearse what you're going to say. All of these are factors of witness testimony. Whether we like it or not, witness testimony is to some extent rehearsed. Even if they don't have a lawyer, which Amber did, of course, and they definitely practiced, but even if they didn't, they would in their own minds, imagine you were summoned, you know, you were issued a subpoena and you had to be a witness and you knew what the case was about and you were interviewed prior. You would try to rehearse your answers in your head, whether you were going to be truthful or not, you would have some idea of what you were going to say when the day comes. That of course doesn't apply to contemporaneous evidence. And this point was really stressed during this hearing. The San Francisco phone call from July 2016 during the restraining order, when it was active, was also referenced, where Johnny again made his allegations to Amber, where he didn't even know he was being recorded. So Amber was secretly recording that conversation. And Johnny told her, you did this, this, and this to me, and she never denied it. It's caught on tape. She never said, yeah, well, I only did that because you did it first or you, you know, you did something worse, for example. It was always just met with, yeah, well, you bring out the worst in me. You know, if you push an animal enough, if you press my buttons enough, I'm, I'm going to react. Mention was also made of how Amber's inconsistency was completely disregarded as a red flag, as a reason to doubt her veracity. Now, the Court of Appeal did put up a bit of an argument, I suppose, with this evidence as well. They said, suppose we accept that her admissions on tape are real. She really did instigate these attacks and she was a perpetrator as well. That doesn't mean that the allegations against Johnny aren't true. They can both be true. And if the judge were to make that finding, isn't that a fair finding? He asked. And Mr. Caldecott responded with, you're speculating at this point. Yeah, I suppose it's a fair finding, but it was never made by Mr. Justice Nichol. He never went along that train of thought. He just inherently took Amber for her word and dismissed all the evidence that supported Johnny. Never once in his judgment did he say, both of them can be perpetrators at the same time. That doesn't make the statements against Johnny defamatory. And this is a response that I really liked from Mr. Calicott. I mean, he's Queen's counsel, he's QC, he's, you know, as good as they get when it comes to barristers. He's really high up there, which is why he was retained for this appeal. I don't believe Mr. Sherborne is a QC. I could be wrong. I'll correct myself if I am. But if I don't, then he's not Queen's counsel. So it was a very good point. Just because that finding was a possibility out there in the universe, that doesn't mean that it should prevent Johnny from appealing this case because it was a finding or a path that was never taken in reality. Miss Sasha Wass, Wass, I don't know how you pronounce her name, they said Wass, so I'm gonna go with that, was the barrister who opposed the application for appeal. The Court of Appeal basically stopped her at one point and said, you're basically just rehashing the judgment. So she just stood there and repeated all of the judge findings as a reason to not grant the appeal. And the Court of Appeal went, so do you have anything else to say? And honestly, she didn't. She was basically cut short. So now for the part that probably most of you are waiting for, which is, what do you think? Is this going to go through? And the response, as usual, if you're used to me in my channel, is I have no idea. The judges were incredibly difficult to read. They were, I suppose, very professional judges, as they should be. They asked Mr. Calicott far more questions than they asked Mr. Wolanski. Now, I don't know if that's a good or bad sign, but Mr. Caldecott always bounced back, I believe. But 
I'm not going to sit here and tell you that I have a good feeling because after what we've all been through with this verdict, I cannot in good conscience say that I have a good feeling about anything. And I've always had this attitude towards cases before YouTube because obviously I've been involved in a few and I've seen how you can never predict these things. I honestly don't know. Of course, I wholeheartedly believe that permission should be granted, even if it's not granted with regards to the fresh evidence, the appeal should still go on regardless. They did say towards the end that they would not take a long time in coming back with their decision and it will be handed down in writing. So there won't be a hearing like this one. And that's it. This was a very impromptu video. I hope you all found it informative and I hope it's answered your questions. The law is gray, as I say in most of my videos. There is no way of identifying how this will turn out. Oh, and this was mentioned before, but it's worth mentioning again in case I get the question. They're asking for a retrial. So they're not asking for the Court of Appeal to just overturn the decision and make their own to substitute it. No. Johnny's team want to go back to trial. All right, so the next video on this topic would most likely be the result. So stay tuned for that one. If you haven't subscribed, then please go ahead and do so. And if you found this video informative, then give it a thumbs up. And if you didn't like it, then go ahead and give it a thumbs down. Don't forget to let me know what you think in the comments below. Thank you so much for watching. A very special and warm thank you to my patrons. Stay safe, everyone, and I'll catch you in a future video.